If you follow Sharia, you will live a pure life. Is there a way for you to present for us three to four um, interpretive schools of thought for Absolutely. Sharia? That, is that every human being is good. That Islam is at odds with Christianity with this, that people are not sinful. They're not, the foundation of them is not the original sin. We don't believe in original sin. Rather that you're good. And is a visa a contract between you and the government that gave you a visa? Absolutely. Islamic law clearly says that th that's a contract by which you need to abide by. Who defines what is the scope? Yes. Totally sure but if I say because Islam teaches that gambling is evil and it should be eliminated, that's where I cross the line. And there's this big thing looming in their young memories, and that's 9-11. So they have this thing in their mind. And one of the believers came to the Prophet and said, Prophet, this Christian man who moved in the city of Medina, you need to expel him out of the city. You need to kick him out. And the Prophet said, why? And if there are voices that would be raised to implement Sharia law in Minnesota, I will be the most vocal opponent of those. Yeah. Part of Sharia law is that you live by the law of the land unless the law of the land violates a moral code. What do you tell your daughters about their equal rights? Excuse me, because he said he converted my two teenage children to Christianity. Let the people of the Torah rule by the Torah. Let the people of the scriptures rule by the scriptures. And let the people of the Quran rule by the Quran. Hello and welcome. My name is Khalid. On behalf of Islamic Media, I would like to welcome you all to our third public event, Sharia Law, Myths and Facts. Uh, we thought this uh, topic is very necessary to discuss because um, I don't know if you've been watching so much C-SPAN like I have been lately. It's all about Sharia Law, I think. <laughs> Especially with the presiden presidential candidates are talking about it all the time and slashing it. Uh, all the time and given misconceptions about what it really means. So uh, hopefully uh, many of those misconceptions will be cleared by the end of today, hopefully. Uh, I'm just going to run quickly through the materials that you have in your folders. The first one is our uh, schedule for today. After me, uh, Mr. Wahawish will start speaking. Uh, the lecture will be about uh, 40 minutes and then we will have uh, a Q&A session. And uh, we are asking you to please ask any questions you have. No reservations. Don't worry about it being offending, not offending. We got used to this. And uh, trust me, we will not be offended. And you can see me at the end of the event if, uh, if one of us got offended. <laughs> um, and that will last, I think, for about an hour. And then we will have the, the lunch starting at two o'clock. And of course, uh, it's gonna be box lunches. We'll, we'll eat here if you uh, care to join us. Uh, get to know us on a more personal levels. So we do we with you too. And then um, we'll conclude everything at 3.15. And that's when we have to uh, start putting everything away. <laughs> so that's the first one, the schedule. The next page is the flyer that I think many of you have received via email or saw it hanging somewhere in an, some library. I don't know how many of you have heard of Mr. Mohawish, um, but this paragraph has been edited so many times because we really wanted to show you every aspect about him. So uh, if you uh, want to get to know him more, uh, just uh, walk to him and introduce yourself, and uh, he'll probably tell you more about himself. Uh, but he currently teaches at St. Thomas University, I think one class. Um, he has been teaching there for three years. Before that, he had, um, he had a business. Uh, I actually used to work for him, too. Uh, he's been a, a friend, a boss, and, uh, and a brother, a big brother. So that's the second page. The third one is this one right here where it has only two lines. 
if you don't see if you don't like anything about this event please let us know because this is how we do it uh, i think we have at the end got a hang of it finally like know how what to do when we go to a library but still uh, i think there would be some gaps here and there please uh, let us know what how we can make it better and also uh, most important uh, note is if you want a topic to be discussed please uh, let us know in that same sheet and just leave them on your table and then we will just go and collect them when we start serving the lunch uh, and again no reservations you can say whatever you want there and the fourth and final page is this resources it's front and back it's got some websites it's got some uh, bookstores uh, YouTube channel if you want to see more of his lectures that we have had in the past not only in public events but other events as well so that's the folder and the one these materials that are clipped you know I think you already know what it means a uh, name tag business card of our organization and two more sheets for you to write so that's the homework <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be specific about the events it could be about anything you can even tell us a story or how you know about us and these three flyers are uh, we try to make them only few uh, so we don't overwhelm you with, uh, with a lot of materials but there is uh, tons more and the websites that are referenced on the same flyers one is uh, Islam rightly explained and this one is actually locally produced by two of our authors uh, in here in the Twin Cities and this one is forum al-islam.org it's about uh, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and why do Muslims have a dress code maybe the next topic will be about dress code <laughs> maybe uh, so without further ado I present you Mr. Oda Mohaush thank you assalamu alaikum peace be with you all it's great to see some uh, familiar faces that I've seen before um, recently I was presented with a case to uh, give my opinion about it and this is a legal case uh, a true case that actually that um, so uh, this is a true legal case that uh, took place uh, in Iowa to a family from Minnesota the family is a Somali Muslim family uh, the father husband uh, was a professor at one of the major universities in, uh, in the Twin Cities. They were traveling through Iowa. They had uh, the father and the mother and their three daughters in the car. As they were traveling uh, through Iowa, uh, the woman who was pregnant uh, had contractions, so they rushed to the nearest hospital. When they got to the hospital, uh, of course, she waited for an hour uh, in, the, in the emergency room until they had a bed uh, for her. Again, this is a true case. This is a real case. Uh, they brought her into a delivery room. Uh, two nurses examined her. They found everything was normal. Uh, the baby, the fetus was uh, healthy. Uh, they called her doctor, uh, the doctor who was present at the, at the ER, who had just gone home and her house was about a mile away from the hospital. Um, so the doctor asked him about all the, all the vital signs and everything else and the nurses assured the doctor that everything was fine and the doctor said, well, call me as contractions get closer and I'll make it to the hospital. Well, time went by, about 3 a.m., uh, contractions increased in frequency but the baby wasn't showing any movement of coming to this world. I, I don't know if I would blame that baby. The baby they had discovered was a boy. And this is a major portion of this story. Well, the doctor came back uh, and suggested that they have uh, they perform a caesarean section uh, on the baby to save the mother's life and to get the baby out of there because the baby was wasn't willing to come. The father said that a caesarean section is against his belief system. So there was give and take there for a while, and finally he was convinced that it, it's, it's to save his uh, wife's life and the baby's life. By 8 a.m., the baby was delivered, but the baby was lifeless. Wasn't dead. 
the baby came, basically survived somehow, but he's paralyzed from the waist down with a lot of brain damage. Now the family traveled back to Minnesota. They gave the baby um, boy a name and uh, the father had to quit his job to care for the baby because a baby like that needs a lot of attention. The family decided to sue the doctor. They sued the doctor for negligence and the basis and for damages. And the basis for damages is that, quote unquote, my Islamic faith puts a lot of emphasis on male members of the family. We have been waiting for a baby boy for a long time. We are deprived of that baby boy now. And they want damages from this doctor who has never been sued in her life before. And record shows that she was an excellent doctor. So I examined the case. There are a lot of other facts that surround the case. And my opinion was um, something that I want to share with you. My opinion is that this case has absolutely no merits. You, they couldn't prove negligence on the doctor's side. In fact, if anything, in my opinion, the doctor who was a professor should be, uh, the, the father who was a professor should have been sued for making two representations, misrepresentations. First, for delaying the cesarean section from taking place and for uh, bringing, making a false statement about what the Islamic faith says about cesarean sections. Now, uh, the, this is the, the plaintiffs obviously are the parents and I was presented with the case to look at it from both sides of the case. What do I think? I feel terrible for the lawyers of both sides because the lawyers of both sides have no idea what Islamic law teaches. My contention was, so what what Islamic law teaches? This case was brought to a court in Iowa and we should rule on it by the law in Iowa, the laws in the state of Iowa. Now ironically, I'm a, I'm a certified commercial arbitrator with the American Arbitration Association and I'm very familiar with our common laws. Uh, ironically, there aren't a lot of differences. In fact, our common law, as most of you know, our law is, is composed of two, two major components. Our common law, which is based on English law, and of course we have our case law that comes out of that legislative law, derivative law, whatever you want to call it. The common law that we get from England, the English didn't dream it up. The English actually borrowed a great deal of their common law from the Moors of Spain. And the Moors of Spain were Muslims. When I was studying to become an arbitrator, I was invited to become an arbitrator, so I had to go to classes to be certified. I was absolutely stunned, because I'm an expert in Islamic law, that 99% of the law is the same. In fact, many of the elements in our common law come directly from Sharia. I'll give you one example. By the way, any legal experts here? Any lawyers? Oh, good. Okay, good. Well, lawyers should sit up, uh, sit up here because this is a legal issue, you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, the law of eminent domain, which basically says that the government, in a nutshell, the government can come to you and take your house for a greater cause. And the government can compensate you for this. This is a law that, that makes perfect sense, uh, unless it's your house that's been taken away, right? Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a law uh, that is practiced in Minnesota, in every city, in every county, in every state in the, of the Union, in fact, in most countries of the world. That law of eminent domain is one example of a law that came from the Moors that is 100% uh, Islamic. In other words, it's a law of Sharia. What happened with this family is that whether with malicious intent or by sheer ignorance, they tried to use something uh, to their advantage in the court of law that is based on ignorance. They introduced something that would make the legal professionals, the lawyers on both sides of this case, and I would imagine the judge, if there was a jury, uh, if there is a jury in the future, if it doesn't resolve before this, everybody would be confused. They have no idea what Islamic law teaches. I contend that it's irrelevant here. But even if it was you know, brought to bear, 
They, they have no idea what it teaches. This amalgamation of understanding or lack of understanding of Sharia is something that Muslims themselves suffer from and frankly speaking, lay Muslims used to their advantage in the West to gain leverage, which causes a great problem for Muslims, American Muslims, Western Muslims in general, and Islam in general. This misunderstanding that develops out of this. Sharia is a very simple term. Sharia literally means the stream of water, which if you follow, you will get to the source. So water being the source of all life, the source of purity, if you follow Sharia, you will live a pure life. Pure life, not only from a moral perspective, but also a healthy perspective, from a societal perspective and an individual and personal perspective. That's what Sharia literally means. Now this became, this word came to represent the set of Islamic laws. And the set of Islamic laws are truly comprehensive. They're divided into personal laws. Those are laws that govern or put the guidelines for your behavior with yourself, with your God, and with the religious establishment. In other words, how do you pray? How do you fast? How much charity do you give? How much of your wealth do you distribute? When do you fast? When do you go to Mecca for pilgrimage? Um, it also governs things that are common on a daily basis. One of the things that Sharia actually deals with is uh, for American immigrants, there are a lot of Americans who were born and raised here and, and they're converts or they were born to Muslim families. But for an immigrant, if you apply for a visa, take to the US for instance, if you apply for a visa to the US, well Islamic law says that when you sign a contract, you are bound by the co that contract in the eyes of God. Is a visa a contract between you and the government that gave you a visa? Absolutely, Islamic law clearly says that that's a contract by which you need to abide by. Well, this leads to a lot of other things. So, if you were born and raised here, and the speed limit is 60 miles per hour, and you go 65 miles per hour, you broke that law, right? And if a cop stops you most of the time, they will let you go. But then, from a Sharia perspective, did you violate that contract? Any Muslim expert who is versed, well versed in the Islamic law will tell you you absolutely are in violation with the contract that you've signed in the eyes of God. Set aside the fact that the cop, the policeman would let you go. But are you accountable to God? And that's a question most Muslims would ask themselves on a daily basis. I'm a speeder, I have to admit, okay? <laughs> and honestly, you know, I have, I have one of those fuzz busters, so you know, there are no cops there, they can't catch me. And I honestly, constantly ask myself this question. When I speed, what if an animal jumps in front of me? I am accountable for that animal in the eyes of God. What if I bother, because some other people don't like when a BMW drives by them and they're going fast and I have another guy who's a BMW enthusiast here. We have the same problem, we have the problem. Most people panic when there are fast cars going by them. So I take all this into consideration because of Sharia law. Now, uh, it also governs things, uh, uh, medical. Uh, um, you know, issues. I had to deal with a friend of mine who was diagnosed with cancer and he told me, Oda, you will decide for me and his family was there. He said, you will decide for me if, uh, you know, if I have a coma, if I'm in a coma, if you, you will decide if they should pull the plug or not. This is a very tough situation. It was one of the toughest situations I had to deal with. I had to contend to learn what the Sharia law exactly says about this. And I, I, frankly speaking, because it was a life and death situation, I consulted with other experts and then we made a decision. What you will find if you study Sharia law is that it's all based on logic. Everything is based on logic. Since we're talking about the personal aspect of Sharia law, one of the things that most people would know, if not all people, is that Muslims don't eat pig or any of the derivatives of pig. Okay? No, no bacon for us in the morning. Although it smells really good, by the way, right? Uh, but but Islam, Islamic class is that if you eat it, it's a sin. But if you are starving and that's the only food that you, you can find, then it's a sin not to eat it. If there is any food, for instance, that is forbidden, but your life depends on that food, then you're obligated to consume that food. 
every other aspect of Islamic law relies on this aspect of reason. Reason prevails. Your life prevails over everything else. So that is the personal side of Sharia. Then there is the societal, which is your, your relationship with your society. Now Islam emphasizes individual rights, but within the realm of the society's right, and your community's right. If there is a conflict between your rights and the rights of the community at large, and it cannot be resolved in any other way, then the community's right prevails. An example of that is eminent domain. Eminent domain, the community needs your house to carve out a highway. It's too bad that you have an nice yard. It's too bad that you love the location. It's too bad all of the stuff. You have to move. You have to be removed. The community would have the authority to remove you. But also you have a personal obligation to accept that judgment. A moral obligation to accept that judgment. This idea permits everything else that we have. Now remember, Islam is a, is, is a, a faith system that calls for a moral society. And this also comes to other issues, which are the things that Islam considers to be vice, sinful. How is your conduct in general in the community? How is it perceived? How does it affect the community? We have laws in Minnesota, in the States. I, I don't know if California would have those laws. But for instance, we have a law uh, that would punish people for indecent exposure. Right, lawyers? Okay, indecent exposure is if somebody takes off their clothes and they run outside, naked. Allah actually punishes them for this. And this would be an example of Allah, of Sharia Allah, that your conduct influences the moral fabric of the society, the, the economic fabric of the society, the well-being of the society, and you are responsible to the society, to the community from that aspect. Then there is the governmental laws. And I'll have to tell you, governmental laws have gotten Muslims in a lot of trouble. I often, when I start speaking about this, I get in trouble with my Muslim brothers and sisters. But I'm honest with myself. You see, the sources of Sharia law, the basis of Sharia law, are two things. One is the Quran, and the second is the conduct of the Prophet, also known as Sunnah. The Prophet spent 23 years establishing the faith. There were those who didn't want this new religion, as in all other religions, to survive. So they attacked him one time after another 88 times. At one point, the Muslims started defending themselves. In this 23-year period, 560 people died of both sides. A side note, for those of you who say, who hear people say that Islam is a violent religion and was built in violence, I would say that that isn't the case. 562 people died in 23 years of the conflict of both sides, while 70,000 people died in one day in 1049 when the Crusaders attacked the city of Jer Jerusalem, killing Jews, East Orthodox Christians, and Muslims. It's not true. But there is another aspect that is very true that happened to Islam. Three days after the Prophet died, three days, the people who took over the Muslim state, the nascent small Muslim state, sent the, their first army to conquer adjacent lands. They conquered uh, the Levant, they conquered Iraq, they conquered Egypt. Within 15 years, they have expanded into a large portion of the then known world, what is known today as the old world. That occupation is looked at differently by Muslims. Some Muslims, the majority of Muslims who take and understand Islam from the perspective of the establishment, the political establishment of Islam, view this as a miracle. Within 15 years, literally a few hundred Muslims were able to conquer and bring down two superpowers, the two superpowers of the time, the Byzantine, East Roman, and the Persian empires. So you look at it, as, you can look at it definitely as a miracle. But also you look at it as another set of Muslims, who I belong to that camp, as it could be a miracle, but let's look at it objectively. There were alliances. 
the Byzantines occupied, had occupied Egypt and oppressed the Coptic Christians. Coptic Christians sided with Muslims against the Byzantines. That's how the Muslims occupied Egypt in a very short period of time. What is important to realize here is that the new state now had a lot of people. Most of the citizens of the state were non-Muslims because the Muslims were a few. And the new state had to institute laws to govern this vast Muslim empire. So they develop precedent. Somebody issues a law. The second caliph was the, the, the forefather of much of the Sharia that we have today that most Muslims believe in. It wasn't the Prophet. This is important to know. And I'll give you some examples of what he had to, what he had to contend with. A story that happened during the life of the Prophet. This is something that Muslims deal with now. So a story that happened during the time of the Prophet, he's in Medina, what is known in what is known today as Saudi Arabia. And one of the believers came to the Prophet and said, Prophet, this Christian man who moved in the city of Medina, you need to expel him out of the city. You need to kick him out. And the Prophet said, why? He said, because his children, excuse me, because he said he converted my two teenage children to Christianity. Now notice that the man didn't come to the Prophet and said, you need to kill him. He said, expel him out of the city. The Prophet's answer to him was revealing as well. The Prophet told him, he said, no, it is your fault that your children converted away from Islam because you haven't brought him to the, to the mosque. I haven't seen you in the mosque for a while. So if they converted, the man was just practicing his faith. I refuse to expel him out of the city. Now let's keep this story in mind. Now, Muslims are a minority in their own state. And you have a leader who is the second caliph who rules the land all the way from uh, Libya all the way to Afghanistan of today. Very vast, big country, newly acquired, newly occupied. And he has to deal with these issues. So during his lifetime, some people said, let's, let's pretend to convert to Islam at the beginning of the day. And at the end of the day say, oh, we didn't like Islam, so we're going to convert away. Now, so what the caliph says, well, anybody who's, who will do that, we're going to cut off his head. It's preposterous. It's outrageous. It goes against the spirit of the Quran. Right? But that's not how he represents it. He represents it as the citizen of the Muslim state is the Muslim. Other people are occupied. And if a person does this kind of act, then it's an act of treason. And the punishment for treason is death. Now, some people buy this and they say, well, we can see your point, and they uh, accept the law. So now the second caliph goes, the third caliph goes, the fourth caliph goes, and now we have success, su successive governments, Muslim governments, who keep the law on the books. The problem is that that law is no longer looked at as a man-made law, but now it's looked at as Islamic law that is holy and nobody can challenge it. And we have Muslim scholars like myself and many, many other Muslim scholars who say, let's go back to that law and strike it off the books. You're immediately accused of being blasphemous and attacking Islam. My friends, the biggest enemy of faith, whether it is the Islamic faith and I dare say Christian faith or Jewish faith or any other faith, is the establishment. No, I'm not a hippie. <laughs> I like establishment. I like order. In fact, I'll disclose to you that I lean towards the Republican view that we need government, but not that big of a government. But we all suffer from this kind of governmental establishment influence where the government or the establishment recreates the faith with its own set of rules. And the victims, the first victims of these manipulations of the law are the followers of the same faith. Muslims have suffered a great deal because of these laws and other laws that the very early Muslims have instituted that have nothing to do. In fact, they go against the very spirit of the Quran and the Prophet's teachings. Why wouldn't Muslims go and say we will follow the Prophet and what he did? If somebody converts somebody else, well, you know, you didn't bring your kids to the mosque. Why would they follow the, uh, 
the establishment, there are some Muslims who refuse to accept the establishment's teachings. They go back to the origin. There are a number of sects. One of them are Shias. The second sect is the Quranis. The Quranis, I don't know how many of you know this, America is great. The Quranis were founded in Arizona. Today they have tens of millions of Muslims who follow them. In their, their uh, headquarters are in Egypt, and they have a lot of people who are following them in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, in Pakistan, and other. They completely reject all of the Sunnah of the Prophet. They just rely on the Quran as a reaction, frankly speaking, as a logical reaction to the, again, the amalgamation of all these narrations and narratives that governments introduced themselves. What Muslims have suffered of or from is just imagine if our administrations, if our White House proclaims to represent God. That never happened, right? We do that quite often, don't we? We went to wars because we said God wanted us to do that. But imagine we go further than that, that whatever the president speaks of, he proclaims to have an authority from God. And that authority, and then he institute, institutes laws. Now he's not only talking to our pocketbook or our freedoms, which is what we suffer from if we violate the law, right? Now you're dealing with the conscience of people with people's, people's relationship with God. Admittedly, Islam and Muslims have suffered a great deal because of this. And because of this, the government manipulated penal law, the Muslim penal law. You hear in, store, in, in the media that Islam wants to stone this person or that person. Okay? And a lot of people are critical of, of, of Muslims for doing that, and they should be. But nobody says, let's pause and let's say, is it really in Islam? Is it in the Quran? No, it's not in the Quran at all. In fact, the early Muslim state instituted stoning of people based on the teachings of the Torah, not in the teachings of the Quran. And Muslims cannot argue with that because the Quran clearly tells us to follow the teachings of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. So when somebody says, I found it in the Bible, we need to follow it, and they institute it as an Islamic law, and you yeah, have 1,400 years later, people have no idea how the law came into place. That's what we deal with. If you strip away governmental manipulation of everything else, Sharia is very, very simple. In fact, all of us practice Sharia. The Quran in chapter 5 clearly states, let the people of the Torah rule by the Torah. Let the people of the scriptures rule by the scriptures and let the people of the Quran rule by the Quran. That is the foundation of what Islam teaches. This was indeed the conduct of uh, the Prophet and his followers during his lifetime, where he sent the first Imam, Imam Ali, his cousin, to Yemen. He said, go rule. Be the judge there because they have, they're converts. And the, the Imam said, there are Christians and Jews there. He said, rule amongst each people according to their all scriptures. He was a known brilliant judge. That was the teaching that he had. This is the teaching of the Quran. But of course, the Muslim state couldn't do that. If the Muslim state allowed everybody to have their own laws, then it would be chaos. Or so they thought. While truly what Islam said, you're a citizen of the state, abide by the laws, but practice your faith as you wish. That's not what the Muslim state did. The Muslim state wanted control of all subjects, including Muslim subjects. And there, therein lies the problem. Now, so if, if, if Sharia law is this simple, Sharia law, at the end of the day, is, Islam is very simple. Believe in one God and do good. You know, when, in, in the Bible, when they came to Jesus and said, they said, good teacher, teach me how, how I may inherit eternal life. What was his answer? He said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. These are the commandments. Follow the commandments. In other words, believe in the first commandment and do good. And that is exactly what Islam teaches us. That is exactly what the Prophet teaches us. The Prophet says, do not call yourself a Muslim if your neighbor is hungry. That's Islam. Do not call yourself a Muslim if you harm another human being with your hand or with your tongue. In other words, by action or by words. That's what Islam is. 
the Islam that, what Sharia Allah is exactly the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught and that Moses taught. It is not complicated. I teach my students, faith is very simple. There's only one God. I'm a monotheist, as you can tell, right? So there's only one God and do good. What is, how do I do good? It's very simple. God built that ability to distinguish between bad and good in us. It is built in every human being. And that is another fundamental uh, teaching of Islam, is that every human being is good. That Islam is at odds with Christianity with this, that people are not sinful. They're not, the foundation of them is not the original sin. We don't believe in original sin. Rather, that you're good. And the things that we do in error or as sinful, these are choices that we make that we should not make. And if everyone, if, if every human being is good, and they are the masterpiece of God's creation, then you are supposed to respect that masterpiece of creation. Should we be worried about Sharia law making its way into our laws? Well, from one perspective, it already had. It already had. Minnesota is a perfect place where a lot of people practice Sharia on, every, on a daily basis. Yesterday, this is a true story, no, the day before, I forget to take the garbage out. My neighbor, who is a devout Christian, made sure that the garbage man comes and walks all the way down my driveway and get the garbage. She was practicing Sharia. She was taking care for, caring for her neighbor. So that aspect of Sharia, it is in all of us. Don't let the word Sharia scare you. Don't let the Arabic word scare you. If I say law, it shouldn't scare us, right? Unless, of course, you're breaking the law, right? <laughs> Sharia, that's what it, what it means. That's exactly what it is. Are there any aspect of Sharia law that we should be afraid of? Absolutely. I will tell you that if there are voices that would be raised to implement Sharia law in Minnesota, I will be the most vocal opponent of those. You know what aspect? The penal law. Not the true original teachings of Islam, but the, the penal law that was instituted by successive governments, Muslim governments, who created laws and labeled them as Islamic laws. What scares me most are those who are not scholars, and Islam suffers from the same thing, by the way, we have, you know, in Islam we have sects that mimic the Catholic Church where they have a structure and an establishment, and before you become a priest you have to go to school and be, have, be vetted, and you can even screw up after that too, right? Islam has sects that do that, but the vast majority of Muslims are parallel to Protestant Christianity, where there isn't that much of structure. In fact, in the vast majority of Muslims, you can be, uh, nothing against janitors, a janitor or a cab driver or a pilot or anything else. If you find God one day, you grow a beard, you wear that long dress, that long you know, Arab dress, instantly people view you as a scholar, and you are not a scholar. You are a Bible, you are a Quran thumper. If, uh, it becomes much more dangerous if you are a good speaker. <laughs> it really does. If you're a good speaker, you can persuade people to do in the name of God what they shouldn't do. That's what scares me most. What scares me most are people who use the name Islam to take advantage of our great laws that respect everybody, respect, respect everybody's rights, culture, and everything else. I wouldn't have had any problem if that professor said, my culture, we like boys. You know, we're farmers. We like a boy who can drive a tractor or ride a camel. I don't have a problem with that. But to say it's Islamic, that completely goes against the teachings of Islam and the Prophet. And the Prophet said, any man, a father, who has been given a daughter to care for, his blessing is threefold the man who was given a son. That man didn't quote that saying of the Prophet. It's a known saying of the Prophet. He wanted advantage, in my opinion. He wanted a legal advantage so he can sue this poor doctor for millions of dollars and wanted to feel good about it. He committed a crime against that woman, committed a crime against his family, and committed a crime against our legal system and against the doctor. That's where the danger is. I am terrified when I see people in England who advocate that we, have, we should have Sharia law. England allowed limited Sharia law in certain neighborhoods. I am totally against this because I saw the judges who stepped up to the plate and said, we are judges. I kid you not. And again, I really do not have anything against cab drivers. I think they're great. 
they were the vast majority of them were cab drivers. They're not Islamic experts. They do not even know the law that was instituted by the state to which I'm opposed, let alone the true teachings of Islam. Now, is it something that I lose sleep over? Absolutely not. Why? For one thing, I don't know how many Muslims are in the audience today. If we have t 100 of them, every 20 would have a different perspective of what Sharia law is. It's a vast law. Our lawyers do not agree on what the law is. That's why we have litigation. We make a lot of money on us, right guys? <laughs> right? So for lay people to claim to know what Islam teaches and to advocate that they want to implement that kind of law on anybody is a fallacy by itself and it's, it goes against what Islam teaches because Islam clearly teaches that you cannot enforce Islamic law upon anybody who is not a Muslim or who doesn't to, want to live by it. Clearly. So, but I, as I mentioned to you, I do not lose sleep over it. Why? For one thing, Muslims are less than 2% of the United States. So if somebody wants to introduce uh, you know, any penal law, remember other laws already exist, but any penal law with which I disagree with, it will take us how many years before we can become a majority and how many more years before we can all agree to what Sharia law is that we can introduce it as legislation. That's one thing. And the second and, and, and uh, more important thing is that part of Sharia law is that you live by the law of the land unless the law of the land violates a moral code. Now you say, wait a minute, aha. Uh -huh. You know, Sharia law does contradict our laws. You know, it's a moral issue for Muslims as it is a moral issue for Catholics to deal with abortion. Nobody cries in the face of, the, of Catholics by saying, uh, hey you guys, we don't like Catholic Sharia law. Or we disagree with them, you know, whether it's a matter of choice or, uh, you know, pro-choice or pro-life, right? But everybody is practicing their faith and emphasizing their faith. That's how Muslims deal with this. There is a big difference between a moral judgment on something and a legal judgment. And frankly speaking, a lot of Muslims get confused about that. Frankly speaking, a lot of Muslim laity in the U.S. and everywhere else get confused between this and that. You can disagree with... Anything you want. You can disagree with abortion. You can disagree with uh, you know, homosexuality. You can disagree with the way the banking system is run. But live with the banking system. I disagree with banks taking interest from me. I have been dealing with banks for over 35 years. Morally, I disagree with the way they treat us. And you know, I think most people agree with me now after the crash, right? <laughs> right? But I've never stopped using the banking system. So for me, it's, the moral judgment here is that you know, God knows that I don't agree with this aspect. But then I have to function within the legal system that's there. I have to respect the laws that are there. That where, where, where I can have a choice, I live with that choice. As part of my practice of Sharia law, and by the way, I do practice Sharia law every single day. Is that as I run different companies, I run companies, I will never deal with companies that, uh, you know, uh, do anything with, have anything to do with intoxicants with tobacco, firearms, or gambling. But how many devout Christians are out there who agree with me, devout Jews out there who agree with me, who practice Sharia law? That aspect of Sharia law is an individual moral judgment in things. If I come to the state, if I go to downtown St. Paul and introduce law that says nobody, nobody should have a, gam a casino. If I say, well, I'm a citizen and I have the right, I, I, I disagree with gambling, then that's my right. But if I say because Islam teaches that gambling is evil and it should be eliminated, that's where I cross the line. Not even my Sharia law would allow me to do that. The problem is, I'll go back to this over and over, the problem is that most Muslims are ignorant of these facts. Most Muslims have no way of distinguishing between what is moral and what is legal. And that therein lies the problem. Their confusion causes confusion in the larger American community, Western community. In addition to this, of course, there are those who would like to demonize Islam. The other day I was at a debate. The debate was 1,000 men, not a single woman. It was a boring night. 
<laughs> 1,000 men, honestly, all middle-aged white Americans. Nothing against white Americans, I love them, right? And uh, the debate was, is Islam really evil or just a little evil? <laughs> uh, the, the guy who was debating that Islam is just a little evil is a friend of mine, great Catholic professor. The other guy who was debating that Islam is all evil was a Catholic professor. And uh, all of these guys thought Islam was really evil. So my friend said, would you, would you come? I said, oh, why not? I wouldn't miss something like that, right? <laughs> so I walked in, sat in the corner. Uh, they didn't know that I was sitting there except for my friend. And I was absolutely stunned to hear what that gentleman was saying. For one thing, he was caught in the Quran over and over and over in things that absolutely do not exist in the Quran. His main point is that Muslims worship a different God than our God. He said a lot of other things that if you were there, you would just shake your head. My friend, I should have seen this coming, he said, Ola, I need you to come up to the podium and help me with the debate. <laughs> Now you can imagine, I'm not a big guy, most of those guys were truck drivers, you know. Uh, so I said, absolutely, I wouldn't miss that either. So I debated, and my point was, you know, you know we worship the same God. I said, I would welcome you to come to the country where I was born, where I am from, Jordan. There are many, many Catholic churches there, because they were all Catholic there. And by the way, they didn't have a very nice thing to say about Protestants. They're not as bad as Muslims, but, you know. Uh, and they didn't like the Pope. They, they call themselves pre-Vatican II Catholics. Okay, so you can imagine how you were. So I said, come to Jordan. I'm not going to debate with you whether Muslims have a different God than Christians. Come to Jordan and tell every priest in every church to, need, to remove the name Allah from the church because every church has the name Allah in it. And that was my main point. And the second thing is I looked at him and I said, have you ever read the Quran? He said, no. I said, you quoted the Quran all night long. Would you please read the Quran? He was a gentleman, he apologized, and he said he will read the Quran, and I believe that he will. But he was constantly saying, Sharia Allah is getting into our land, it's going to take over. I haven't seen Sharia Allah taken over. Or if he's talking about the Sharia Allah where he would pay some charity to the church, well, he's already doing that. He should stop doing that. That's the danger of Sharia Allah, right? A lot of confusion, a lot of political manipulation, a lot of motives that are in my opinion, insincere motives behind making a big hype against this issue of Sharia law, it reminds me of our fear of communism, that communism was taken over, uh, you know, it's going to get out to our government, and nobody speaks of communism anymore, right? But also it reminds me of, many of you probably would remember, or at least know something of the story, where a radio announcer announced that aliens were landing, and everybody got out their guns and they were ready to fight the aliens. The threat of Sharia law is actually less than aliens landing because I believe that aliens are coming. Thank you very much. I will take your questions if you have any. Go ahead. You did say um, one should live by the law of the land unless uh, it violates a moral code of uh, Islamic faith. So is there a specific common law, for example, in the U.S. that would violate your Islamic belief? Well, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example of that. What if, hypothetical question, what if we have the Democrats, those bad Democrats in Minnesota, institute a law that you have to drink every night? I'd say no. I'd go against that law. A more practical example of that is, what if there was a draft? and you have to go and fight in a war that you believe is against your faith. I'll tell you, I tell my kids, don't ever fight in a war. It doesn't matter, don't ever fight in any war. I don't care whose war it is. I don't care how righteous it looks like, right? So what if we have an instituted draft and people say you have to go fight? I wouldn't go. You know, put me in jail, put me in jail. That's another example of that. Make sense? You know, not that I can identify, but I can see how they could come up. I can see how they could arise. You know, we have the same debate about abortion. It's, it's, it's a raging debate, right? It really, it's the same debate that Muslims would have with Allah. You know, although Islam is much more liberal than conservative Catholics when it comes to the issue of abortion, basically at the end of the day, you know, incidentally, um, in Muslim countries, the issue of abortion is not a, a non-issue because a woman goes to her doctor, her doctor, male or female, 
a diagnosis and says, you know, sorry, we have to abort the baby, nobody gets involved. Now the husband, nobody. It is a non-issue. I think it became an issue here because, become, because it became a political issue. And make anything political, it'll become a really tough issue to deal with, right? Uh, same with everything else. For instance, you know, the, the laws of most states say, if not all states, prohibit polygamy. Islam allows polygamy. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to live by the law here. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, when there is no conflict, you live with the, with, with the outcome. But when there is a conflict, as the examples that I gave you, that's when it becomes a moral judgment. Am I willing to violate my own moral compass and live with the law or not? Okay. Well, one of the things that Islam teaches, for instance, you pay taxes. Okay, you pay taxes, you participate in building roads, you know, distributing electricity, doing all that stuff, internet, whatever it is, right? So that's all right. But if the ta some of the taxes are taken and used for war, well, that's a, a problem for most Muslims because not all Muslims have the same views that I do. I, I sound like a, a Republican pacifist, you know, <laughs> right, in a lot of ways. Um, so how do you deal with this? Well, I pay my taxes because the law requires me to pay the taxes. What I do morally is I wish that the government doesn't use my taxes for war. That's the extent of it. You know, I will not do business with companies that make weapons or bullets here in the state. I've never done, I rejected a lot of business because of that. That's how I make these things work together. And I would imagine, I know in fact, many Christians, many Jews, many devout people deal with them in this perspective. You know, uh, vegetarians don't eat animals. Yet we kill a lot of animals. Minnesota is a slaughterhouse for animals. How do they deal with it? They don't like it, but they live with it. That's exactly how we deal with it as well. Any other questions? Um, I understand that uh, there was a Senate file a, a legislation that was for the, in the, here in the state of Minnesota, and I'm reading an article that says it was recently introduced but withdrawn. Were you involved in that? Or? I, I know about it. Okay. Yeah, where, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to you know, jump the gun here. Somebody introduced a law to prohibit Sharia law of being introduced in the state of Minnesota, right? And Muslims were all up in arms. Oh no, my God, you know, this is anti-Muslim. And I see the point. It's like saying people should not wear little hats on their heads. And we're not gonna talk about Jews here, you know? There is a sense of prejudice in it. So there is a fear, there is a prejudice and fear-mongering element in it. If people ask me, I would have said, let him. I don't care. It really has no practical implications on Muslims. Zero practical implications on Muslims. But the people who introduced them had absolutely no idea what the Sharia law was, and they felt that they needed to do something like this because they're, pro they're political activists. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Um, who defines what the scope of Sharia law is? You said that there's. Uh three parts to it, the personal, the societal, parts, yeah. and then the governmental. But then you kind of backed off, I thought, and said, well, the governmental really isn't Sharia law. I, yes. I'm asking, who defines what is the scope yes. of total Sharia law? Sharia law is four parts. I probably wasn't clear about it. There is the personal, societal, governmental, and penal law, okay? And the governmental, governmental, uh, uh, personal, and societal all include economic law, okay? So for instance, economic law says you cannot have a monopoly, according to Islam, you cannot have a monopoly, you cannot uh, misrepresent products. It's our laws. I wish actually some would be implemented here. We wouldn't have had the crash that we did, right? Uh, but this division was made by scholars, by Muslim lawyers. So if you are a scholar, you can divide them differently. You can, you can categorize the different laws differently. The prophet didn't do that. The prophet said, don't have a monopoly. The prophet said, don't put your money under your pillow, make sure that it works in the economy. And then from that we derived, what the prophet, what the prophet said is, if you sell goods, don't be the only one who sells those goods. So we derived from that, that the prophet was saying, you cannot have a monopoly, okay? So it's us, the scholars, who defined and put these different categories in law. You will have new scholars who will divide them differently. You'll have, actually, there are many scholars who, uh, you know, defy and study, uh, challenge the status quo. Look at this. Sharia law is up to interpretation. It's like our law. It is subject to interpretation. The same Sharia law in Saudi Arabia that says women cannot drive, right? 
allows women in Iran to have race car drivers who are world known. Why S society has something to do with it, understanding of the text has something to do with it, uh, language has a lot to do with it, logic has a lot to do with it. When you study a verdict, it is very similar to the way our judges study our laws. So then if you are an expert, you write a book. And the book is either adopted or ignored. If it's adopted, you become a leader of a sect or a leader of, of an idea, of an interpretation of Sharia law. So um, what I advocate is that let's go back to the basics and look at the basics and derive laws that are compliant with our time. If we do that, we're not going to have a problem. Uh, a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, an Iranian scholar, uh, did a great study on imprisonment in Islam. Is it legalized? Is it uh, legislated or not? And he, his study was fantastic. He uh, came to the conclusion that imprisonment for punishment is not allowed in Islam. Imprisonment for rehabilitation is allowed in Islam with one exception. If people, if you cannot rehabilitate some people, then you exile them. And the way they exile them there, they literally have an island where they send people who are, you just can't fix them. You put them in this island, you care for them, you respect their life, but they can't interact with the society anymore. And based on this, the kind of prison system that you have changes. Here in the US, our prison system is subject to a lot of criticism because now we have companies that benefit from having prisoners. You know, that is unfair. That is very, very dangerous in my opinion. Uh, you have a lot of people on death row. We pride ourselves in, and talk about human rights, but our record is not that pretty. Uh, so th at the end of the day, it's to lift to legal experts. You know, why is it in the United States we have the death penalty in some states and they kill a lot of people and say, oops, like Texas, and we don't have the death penalty in Minnesota. We have the same common law. It's the interpretation, interpretation of case law, the interpretation of the sources of the law. It's how the society, we're, we're somewhat more of a liberal society, more of a human-oriented society, so we reject the death penalty. Islam exactly deals with the same thing. There are 54 Muslim countries in the world that belong to the Organization of Islamic Countries. You go to Malaysia, their understanding of Sharia law and implementation differs from that in Pakistan, different from that in Turkey, from Egypt. It's because they're different people, different languages, different customs, different understandings of the, of the text. So there isn't one Sharia law. Okay. Go ahead. Then to take that last thought that you have and, and the question the gentleman had over here, is there a way for you to present for us three to four um, interpretive schools of thought for Absolutely. Sharia, yeah. and then some major constructs that may differ across those interpretations. Yes. Uh, probably giving you examples would be better, right? Taxes. One school of thought in Islamic Sharia says that taxes is a moral obligation. The state cannot enforce it upon people. And that is the Shia law. Says you cannot, you can't come to a, a person and say you have to calculate. Uh, Islam defines what taxes are: two and a half percent of your income if it reaches a certain level, and then twenty percent of your access income. Okay, give it to, and it, it defines where those uh, taxes should be used. Does the government have the right to go and collect taxes or not? Shia, one sect of Shia says you can't. On the flip side. Hanafi school, which is one of the Muslim schools, which is the uh, widest followed today, has the widest following, says yes, the government has every right to follow that. Okay? Another school is, uh, comes, uh, is a school that differs when it comes to uh, sexuality. It's a hot subject, a hot subject in the US and around the world now because the United Nations became involved in it. So you have one school that says, if you have sexual inclinations, that define or predefine, or even uh, the, the way that I'm trying to translate it uh, accurately, that if there is leverage of one gender over another in you, then you have every right to have, uh, to choose that gender and perform an operation. Many people, you know, because of the media, we view Iran as a very, very conservative and very scary place. <coughs> Iran subsidizes sex change operations by choice. Because that's what the loss is. Okay, you get other countries that says, if you 
you know, if you even proclaim to be gay, then we're going to kill you. Unless you're a prince or a king, then that's fine. <laughs> that's what we do. So that's another aspect of it. Another aspect of it is war. Okay? War, is it defensive? Does Islam permit defensive war or offensive war? You have a school of thought that says no. Clearly, the Quran states that uh, it is only defensive that you can get, engage in war. While you have another school that says, no, we need to occupy other lands to give people the chance to know what Islam is and convert. These are all different schools of that. So it's, they're vastly different interpretations of the same text. And they all argue about the same verses of the Quran. Is this allowed or not? Okay, the verse that I told you, 22, uh, 38 in the Quran, uh, that talks about war, it says permission has been given to those who have been wronged to fight back. So you, as a legal expert, I tell you, well, permission is given. That means the default is that you don't have permission to engage in war. And you have to be, have been wronged. You have another expert who would say, no, it's a permission. It's a wide range in permission. I can do whatever I want. It's subject to interpretation. And therefore, I tell people, don't fear Sharia Allah because we haven't figured out what we're going to do with it. You know, it's, it's, there is a lot of debate about it. Um, I'm curious about the word scholar. And one person's scholar is another one's charlatan. Yes, and, thank you. And um, whether you consider this person a charlatan or scholar, uh, to quote you is perhaps up to uh, one's perspective, but there is a gentleman in Michigan who's written a book, uh, I think it's called Love Wins, and the book suggests there is no hell, which has caused dilemmas for many Christian faiths who base their uh, decisions based on heaven and hell. And I have heard often about Islam's heaven or fortune with uh, damsels and lovely uh, after your death. What is the Islamic, your understanding of heaven and hell, and how does that fit in your scholarly viewpoint? Uh, thank you. First, to comment on who's a scholar and who's not, that's another one of the challenges that Muslims have. As I mentioned to you, you know, in many Muslim communities, literally to be a scholar, all you have to do is have a big beard. I would never qualify. Okay? <laughs> but the true scholar, from my perspective, somebody who went to a, a, a recognized school, accredited school, that has been around for a long time, that's a true representative of the faith, where you study. And I will tell you, the school that I studied in, I am very proud of it. I would wish that everybody can visit it, um, and everybody can learn in that school, because you will learn that they are absolutely free thinkers. That's one of the problems that we have. We have a lot of people who speak on behalf of the faith, and they're called reverend or sheikh equivalent, right? And they become an authority as long as they look, they look, they look it and they quack it, you know? Um, as far as heaven and hell, you would, what, what all Muslims agree to is that there is heaven and hell, okay? There is heaven and there is hell. What they disagree in is, like a lot of Christians, who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Is, what is more populated, heaven or hell? Okay, there are some Muslims, like the Christians, who say only 144,000 people are going to heaven, the Christians. There are Muslims who say only us are going to heaven. Not even the other Muslims. Forget about them. It's only us. There are Muslims who believe that the vast majority of people go to heaven. And that's the school that I adhere to. It's the Shia school of thought. Where it goes, the logic behind it goes like this. God is just. That is one of the positive attributes of God. In other words, if you take that attribute away of God, then that's not God that we're talking about. So God is just. God says, follow the law. Right? Now, look at humanity. Humanity is divided into three groups. One group that knows the truth and follows it. Of course, those will go to heaven, right? One group that doesn't know the truth. Or, let me talk about the third group. One group that knows the truth and rejects it. Those are bad people, the Hitlers of the world, okay? But the vast majority of humans fall in the middle. And there's one of the greatest books that has been ever written about faith, in my opinion, is a book that's called Divine Justice, written by a scholar, Shia scholar, who gives an example in this book, or in one of his lectures, I don't remember now, where he says, uh, let's imagine that there is a ship sailing the ocean, and the ship 
they, they have a shipwreck. And the only person who survives is a little girl. She falls on the island, she holds into a piece of wood, she goes on an island, and she's the only one who lives in that island. She never, never in, interacts with another human being. The only thing that she interacts with are you know, birds, nice, beautiful animals. Sounds like heaven, doesn't it? No internet, though. So, so now she's in this island, she survives, she's in her 80s, and she dies. She's never heard of Allah, never heard of Yahweh, she's never heard of the Father, never heard of Jesus, never heard of Moses, never heard of Muhammad. Does she go to hell? He says no. And he says the vast majority of people on the face of the earth would follow the truth if they were given an equal chance to know what the truth is. But he says that most people, due to environmental and other influences, are not given an equal chance to know the truth. The Quran actually supports to a great degree his view. So the vast majority of people go to heaven. Now I like what he does there because some of us work harder than others. So he says heaven is different ranks. Okay? So you know, you might live in a lake and somebody else might live in the ocean. But, you know, torment. You know, he says God is, God is merciful, God is graceful, God is just. He says even torment is not uh, eternal for a lot of people. Some people will be tormented for horrible things that they have done, but God will only decide when he gets them out of there. But I, would, I personally contend that some people deserve to be tormented forever. Those are the ones who killed a lot of people. I mean, Hitler killed over how many? 25 million people? That would be, I, I tell you, I mean, if, I'm, if I go to heaven, I don't know if I will. I have a, fr a Catholic, that Catholic friend of mine the other day made a statement that was very funny, but it's true. He said, I don't know. He said, you know, I tried to be good most of my life. He said, probably in the day of judgment, I'll get a C plus, you know? <laughs> So maybe I'll get a C, I don't know. But let's say that I get a C and I made it into heaven. Imagine you're walking there and you, see, you look to your right and there is Hitler walking. You say, God, he could have killed a lot of people and he would have put me in heaven, you know? I hated that neighbor of mine that I wanted to kill, right? But logic tells us that some people do horrible things against God's creation that they bring torment upon themselves. Sometimes it's worth a year of jail. Sometimes it's worth, you know, uh, hundreds of years. For all we know. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Hi. I oh, by the way, let me just tell you one thing. Yeah. I'm sorry, I want to add. There is a sect of Islam that believes that the vast majority of the people of hell are women. Mm. Seriously. The same sect that gave a verdict, issued a verdict, that women, the ladies here will love this verdict, or the guys, I don't know. Oh. Women, it is a sin for women to browse the internet without a male companion sitting there. It's the same sect that says women cannot drive. I heard Lori Steinem last Tuesday night. She would disagree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, there are several of us here, I think, from the Minsky system. We teach community college, largely in the humanities ethics and religion and so on. And I'd, I'd like to ask for some teaching advice on our behalf. So we've got this, this um, demographic that is largely young, white, Christian, getting more fundamental in some of the northern suburbs. Plus, we've got a few Muslim students, some of them immigrants. So we've got this situation with these young students who are um, not very open or have not been very open or had many opportunities to learn about other religions. And there's this big thing looming in their young memories, and that's 9-11. So they have this thing in their mind about, you know, what these people are and how they're different from me. And there's, there's definitely a separation right away that you can feel. So my question is, how do we just address that early on? You know, if we wait in our religion courses till Islam comes on the scene, it's towards the end of the semester and it's getting late. So how do we introduce that that dynamic is happening in the room early on and just get it out there in a respectful manner? You know, it's, it's very difficult for me as an educator and uh, as a Muslim and as somebody who studied and some, some people call a scholar, right, to teach about Islam. You know why? The very first thing that we have in Western scholarship is that we have a lack of good sources. Most of Islamic history, probably 98% of the sources that I've seen out there are based on Karen Armstrong's translation of Ibn Kathir, an 8th century historian. And his, uh, his interpretation of history is one-sided. It's a Muslim interpretation, but it's a government 
And actually, a, a, a maverick government interpretation at that. That is a, a, a huge challenge for me as an educator to teach. So I have to produce my own text. I have to produce my own sources. That's one thing. The second thing, the second challenge that I have is that most people in the West view most Muslims as experts in Islam. As experts in Islam. So you would have, and Muslims are very opinionated in general. <laughs> you know, Muslims would say, no, no, this is haram, this is a sin. And a non-Muslim would say, well, okay, I'm sorry. I deal with this on a daily basis. Last week, last week I uh, received an email from an officer who is trying to help. She's volunteering to help blind Somali kids. And she said, can I use guide dogs with them? And he said, absolutely. In fact, you have to use guide dogs with them. I had a storm of, re of objections from the Somali community. They said, no, dogs are bad. And he said, guys, dogs are bad in Somalia because they bite people. These dogs are, and a lot of, t a lot of times, are more gentle than you are, you know? <laughs> but, and I didn't win. I lost that battle. You will have Muslim students who give their opinions. And, and, and if you don't know, you would accept their opinions as fact. One of the things that you should do is, if you have a Muslim, in fact, I don't care if it's a scholar or not, who makes a statement, ask him for a source. Because Islam is like Christianity. I listened to a YouTube video of Muslims criticizing Christian preachers. And this guy cited, he had a speech, there was a speech by a Christian minister who, who quoted the Bible over 10 times, and he proved that he was lying. There isn't such a thing in the Bible. People do that, especially with statistics, you know, constantly. That's the second thing. The third thing is when it comes to September 11. It did happen. It was a crime. A lot of people died. What are we going to say that they were visiting, they were bringing flowers to New York? You know, it's true. But then we have to remind people that there are criminals in every community. There are criminals in every faith. There are criminals in every society. And really give them true statistics of what a lot of people have done in the name of Christ. Yeah. 12 million Native Americans were killed in the name of Christ because they refused to convert. Uh, tell them about the history of Minnesota here where Native Americans were given 10,000 blankets with disease that wiped out a lot of people because they weren't Christian. They justified it to themselves. They're not Christian, so we can do this. And remind people that Christ wouldn't have accepted that. Neither would Muhammad accept what these people have done in his name. I said this on NBC News right after September 11. I said I would have never blamed Christianity for what Hitler has done, and I would never blame Islam for what these criminals have done. I think just give them the facts about it. And uh, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. I just have a question about the roots of um, Islam, Muslim. And I was always taught Abraham and Sarah, Sarah's maid, Hagar had Ishmael, and that was the beginning of, is it? I mean, where is Ishmael and Mohammed? <laughs> you know, you have a pencil in your hand and you have a paper in front of you, write down this book, would you? The name of this book, any of you who's interested, this book was written by a Catholic professor. The name of the book is Ishmael Instructs Isaac. Ishmael Instructs Isaac. Catholic professor, devout Catholic, he compares stories of the Quran to stories of the Bible. During that debate last week that I told you about, uh, one of the men got up and asked a question. He said, I heard, I heard, that the Quran, I'll come back and answer your question. He said, I heard that the, Quran, the Abraham of Muslim, the Muslim Abraham, was so mean to his son Ishmael, while Abraham of the Bible was so nice to his son Isaac. Is that true? And the guy didn't know that I was there first. He said, yeah, that's true. He, Dr. Coltner, did I give you his name? John Coltner, K-O-L-T-N-E-R, okay? John Coltner mentions the real stories. And you can have access to the real story by just Googling or look in, just open the Quran and open the, open the Bible. K-O-L-T-N-E-R, okay? I highly recommend this book to everybody, all right? So the, the true story of Abraham and of Abraham in the Old Testament and Abraham of the Quran is almost similar, but it varies slightly in a couple of places. The most manifest is when Abraham was ordered by God to kill his son Isaac. The Old Testament story shows Abraham has hidden the fact from Isaac. 
He tells the people, let's take him, put him on a donkey, travel with him for a couple of days, and you guys leave us, I'll take him up to the mountain, I'll lay him down on a rock and cut off his neck. That's the biblical story. The Bible is available for everybody to read, right? Uh, Isaac freaks out, starts fighting back, and then he's saved. The story of the Quran doesn't say if it was Isaac or Ishmael, although most Muslims say it was Ishmael because we descend from Ishmael, right? But it doesn't matter who it was. The, Bible, the Quranic story says that when Abraham saw the vision from God that he should slaughter his son, what did he do? He goes to his son and he says, son, I have a divine vision that I should slaughter you. What should I do? Because if you don't have choice, then you are not a Muslim. So he acts as a Muslim. He says, he says Father, do as you are ordered. I will be one of the patient ones. So that's the story. But how it is, what are the roots of Islam? What Muslims would say, it's the same roots as Christianity, Judaism, the Abrahamic faith, Noah's faith, Enoch's faith, and Adam. They all came from God, which is believe in me and do good. That's it. That is Islam. There is nothing else. All the other fluff that you see, people bring it upon Islam, as they did to Christianity, as they did to Judaism. So uh, the Quran repeatedly says that Islam literally means submission to God. You submit to God's system, basically. What does it mean? You live within God's system, don't harm God's system, live within other, with others according to God's system. What does God's system? Be good to them. That's it. Anybody can be a Muslim and act as a Muslim without even knowing it. Many, I believe many Minnesotans are Muslims without proclaiming it. They're good people. That's what Islam is. So that is the teaching. Now, you know, you have a lot of philosophical answers. We say, we are a continuation. We took the message of, uh, you know, of, of uh, Jesus as it was devi as it deviated with Paul and on, and then you had the Nicene Council, which you know, brought up the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. We reject all of that. We go to what Jesus taught. There is only one God. He was the miracle of God. Muslims do believe. I don't know how many of you know this. Muslims believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Christ. He is seated, seated next to the throne of God. He'll come back to establish the kingdom of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He walked in water. I went to the lake, actually, where he walked in water, supposedly. And he brought the dead back to life. All these are Muslim things. You know? So what Muslims say is that we are uh, a renewal. We are the promise of Jesus in John 14. That's what Muslims would say. We are a renewal of Christianity. And Muslims would say, how dare we say that the Abrahamic tradition would stop with Jesus? It's continuing. And it will continue on when Jesus comes back. That's what Muslims say. There is a message of hope that I love to tell everybody. I'll take your questions from now until Monday if you want. But I want to share this belief with you that most Muslims and not many Muslims share with others. So we believe that, all Muslims believe that at the end of times, one of the descendants of Prophet Muhammad will appear to call for human justice. That person will meet with Jesus and they will pray together. And together they will bring the kingdom of God to humanity. This is not the end of the story. That person, his mother, was the descendant of Simon Peter, who, Islamic teachings again, who was the maternal cousin of Jesus. Remember, Jesus didn't have a father, right? So in other words, what Islam teaches is that cousin Jesus, and his name is Muhammad, and cousin Muhammad, who's a descendant of Prophet Muhammad, will come together, will pray together, will bring peace back together. And why specifically Jesus and the descendant of Muhammad? Because there are 1.6 billion Muslims and 2 billion Christians. They'll bring them together. Now, both Islam and the Bible, in my opinion, to teach that not everybody is going to accept them. Many Christians and many Muslims are going to fight against them. And Muslim tradition is very clear about that. But they will prevail and that they will bring peace to humanity. I love this teaching. It brings so much harmony and peace and comfort to my heart that the people who are running the world, you know, Hindus and, and Buddhists and other people of the world, they're sitting there watching us, Muslims and Christians. Christians need our oil, we sell them our oil. We take the money. Christians come to our countries, they want to make sure that they get the oil. We're idiots, you know? It should be just free trade, right? But uh, unfortunately, we complicate things. So we are the ones, Muslims and Christians, are the ones who really are wreaking havoc in the world. But this message that they together will bring peace to the world is a message of a lot of hope that I, and, and peace that I love.
Any other questions? Uh, so, oh, so a lawyer asking me a question. Okay. No, no. Hello. Oh, okay, okay. I was going to say I refuse to ask, but go ahead. No, I do not like, I have translated about 73 books and essays and translating textbook is extremely difficult. Muslims suffer from this, Christianity suffered from this for a long time. I, every time I read the Bible, I mean I read the Quran in English, I say I need to retranslate it, but of course I'll translate it the way I understand it. That's the problem. Uh, there is one that I would prefer over others, but I don't consider any of them to be totally reliable, and that's Qul Qara'i, and I'm gonna ask Khalid and uh, Minnesota media, uh, Muslim media, to send an email to everybody with the link. That is, in my opinion, the closest to accuracy. But translating is, tr translating religious text is, is a crime, it is difficult. You know, I wrote a book about the Bible in Arabic, and it's widely read, and I gave examples of translations where Western Christians suffer because of these translations. Did any, do any of you know about The Voice? The Voice is a new Bible that was released just last week. A long, running project to reintroduce, you're shaking your head, you've heard of it, uh, reintroduce King James version of the Bible. And in it, I saw the interview with the scholar, the head scholar, he said we took the term Christ out and we replaced it by King. I don't know if you saw the interview. And so the interviewer said, well, why did you do that? He said, because Christ is a, tra is a transliteration, not a translation. And he's right. Christ is a Greek word, which means the anointed one. The Messiah, I know Arabic, I know some Hebrew, not a lot of Hebrew. It literally means the one who was anointed. Literally, oil was put in his head and was wiped, anointed. He was anointed with it. But that denoted that he'd be the king. Okay? So there was a derivative of this, which means that he would be the promised king. Okay, we all, I mean, Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus was, will be the king of the world at the day of judgment, right, or towards the end days. But when he translated it as king, he also put his own opinion. He should have put it as the anointed one. Let people derive from it whatever they wanted to derive. Another aspect of the Bible that was like that, and the Quran, by the way, has, we have the same issues, is where they translate in the Hebrew Bible, in the Song of Solomon, Mohammedim. Or they would translate names to the meaning of the name. Imagine the name Margaret in a textbook, and somebody doesn't take, put the name Margaret, they say, what is it, a flower, it's a type of flower, right? A mountain rose. Religious texts suffer, suffer from this, and, and Muslim religious text suffers from the exact same issue. I don't know how we overcome it. What I tell everybody, if you really are serious about religion, study Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. You know, over here, over here. Yeah. Uh, I, I admire the way that you use your own personal reflection to teach. Um, and, and I'm intrigued by the concept that uh, as an individual, they have a moral obligation to accept the community's judgment. Uh, so, so for my own reflection, uh, speaking as um, a practicing lazy Christian, I'm, I'm okay with the gamble that God's mercy will grant me salvation. So the question is, how is there a word for mercy and salvation in the Quran and how do they how do you integrate that? Into your very, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Great question. The first word in the Quran is basically in the name of. The second one is Allah, the name of God. And then the third word is the merciful and the fourth word is graceful. And th those words start every chapter of the Quran. They, in fact, are found in every chapter of the Quran, throughout every chapter of the Quran. Merciful and graceful. Uh, I think your question leads to something else. Well, how do we receive salvation? Is that right? How do we receive salvation? I love this question. We receive salvation by believing in God and His good. Being good to our neighbors. I don't care if you are, I'm, I'm talking about human, generic human being. If you are a devout Muslim, a devout Christian, a devout Jew, a devout Hindu, Buddhist, I don't care if you wear the Pope's garment, which costs $300,000. I 
I don't care if you carry the biggest cross or the biggest Quran or we wear the biggest turban. I don't care if you go to Mecca a hundred times in your lifetime. If you're not good to your neighbor, if you're not good to humanity, if you are a liar or a cheat, if you don't help people, God is not going to like that of you. It's a waste of your time. Or if you believe that Jesus came as the Messiah, He is the way, and through Him only we shall achieve the kingdom of God, as Muslims do, by the way. It doesn't do you any good if you don't do good work. Yes, a lot of us, you know, where the grace of God comes in, is where a lot of us are not given an equal opportunity to know the truth. And none of us are. None of us are. We have, in the U.S. in general, we have Fox News which educates the Fox. <laughs> And in the Middle East, listen to this, this is really intriguing. I think you'll find this intriguing. In the Middle East, we have the Middle Eastern Broadcasting Corporation that educates Muslim and black Christians. Okay? So it is, we are the cowboy society. Mm -hmm. We love cowboy movies because we know the good guys and we know the bad guys and the good guys are good shots, the bad guys are idiots, right? <laughs> it's simple. We practice this in our thinking. And Muslims are practicing that as well, too. Right? So, when I find out that the second largest shareholder of Fox News is Prince Walid bin Talal of Saudi Arabia, who is the largest shareholder of NBC News, which is based in London, that demonizes Christianity, I scratch my head. What are they trying to do? Most people have no idea what the truth is. If you go to, I'll use an old lady in Iowa, you know, and you tell her, what is this? Like? He says, oh, I, I don't know, they're just bad people. It's the same old lady that you would find in a rural village in Jordan. And we'd say, we're the, which, we're Christian, and he says, oh my God, these guys are polytheists. You know, the best Christian that they can imagine, Christian woman that they can imagine, Madonna, and I don't mean the mother of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly, I, I'm, I know it's funny, but it really is true. So most people don't know. That's where the grace of God comes in. God knows the goodness in our hearts. And God's, God knows, if we were exposed to the truth, what kind of people would that's where the grace of God comes in. And I tell you, you know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, Terry will get a C, my, my friend, Terry Nichols, will get a C plus. I might get a C or a D or a D minus. I hope I don't get an F. It's with the grace of God that I'm going to tell you. Go ahead, Dr. If, if I want to know what Minnesota law is, I can go get these books that are on the statutes of Minnesota. But where is the sheriff law written down? There are all these interpretations of it, but, but is the text itself disputed? Great. The question is, I'll, I'll repeat it because it wasn't very clear. If I want to know what Minnesota law is, I go to a website and look what the law is, right? Uh, where would I find Sharia law? How do I know what it is? I'll ask you a question and I'll ask you a question, but you don't have to answer my question. If you have a legal dispute, would you go and represent yourself, or would you hire a lawyer at four hundred dollars an hour to represent you? Depends how much money it gets. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Lawyers would tell you that you should always hire a lawyer. And there's one here, by the way, she has business card. <laughs> the reason that you do that is that although the law is there and it's written in what we believe is English, a lot of times we don't understand it. We hire experts on the law. Muslims do the same thing. The vast majority of Muslims say, I need the law, I'm going to practice the law on my own. That's what a lot of Muslims suffer from. They need lawyers to interpret it for them, and Muslim jurists are nothing but lawyers. Where do you define Islamic law? What interpretation? I'll give you a set of Islamic laws that's two volume, that has every Islamic law in it, and it's available in English. But you have one set that's inter the interpretation of this person, another set that's the interpretation of that person. The basis of the law are all found. Pick up the Quran, they know you the Quran. That's the basis of the law. Can you derive law on your own from the Quran? If you're not an Islamic expert, you don't know how to, right? So what Muslims do is they go to these other books, some Muslims go to these other books and rely on them or you know, uh, uh, get advice from legal Islamic experts. The problem is, again, with most Muslims is that they read something in the Quran or they read a narration and they have no idea if it's authentic or not. And based upon it, they pass a judgment. <coughs> Right. I'll give you the set of books, by the way, so if you're interested. I know you would be, probably. Go ahead. Go ahead, this. Oh, okay. Um, um, 
uh, shoot, just lost my train of thought. Um, there's there's a preconception, and uh, I've heard this I've heard this uh, um, discussion many times that Christianity is now the most oppressed religion in the world, and it's and it's ex and I, I heard this from a professor at Luther Seminary, and I was completely surprised because I, I know our country is basically bombing six Islamic countries right now, one way or another. Um, and then last night at the Bonhoeffer presentation, uh, Eric Metaxas gave a presentation on Bonhoeffer, and someone asked him, if Bonhoeffer was alive today, who, which oppressed people would he um, stand behind and, and champion? And he didn't really say anything. He said the unborn, which was a safe comment, and then in the book signing, I asked him, I was surprised you might not have mentioned Muslims. And he told me I was oversimplifying, and he shut me off. Um, I was stunned. Uh, and I guess I'm wondering, what's your reaction to um, this Luther, Professor Luther Seminary? Uh, now, on the other hand, there's another professor who's recently re written a book, Was Jesus a Muslim? His name is Schettinger. It's one of the best books I've read Mark. for Christians to try and understand Islam. Mark, so, um, Mark, Mark is a fantastic writer. Yes. Oh, you know, okay. Yeah. So, uh, what's your, just your opinion, please? You know, I'll comment about what he said. Is Christianity oppressed? Absolutely. Not Christians. Christianity, in my opinion, is oppressed by its own establishment. Oh, yeah. I have told my Christian friends and brothers many, many times, you guys are destroying Christianity from within. There is so much infighting between Christians that before it used to be with the sword and the spear, and now it's by the tongue and the mega churches. That's what it is. Christianity is being deluded. Do you think the average Christian young person would know would have any idea what Christianity is today? They have no idea. It has been watered down to a debate about not that abortion is not important, the life of Jesus is not important. But that's what it is. It's about gay rights. It's about very little things. And you have Christians who are devoting everything in their wealth and life to controlling the government. While well, Jesus said, leave what is to Caesar, to Caesar, and what to God, to God. That's a misinterpretation. I agree. <laughs> but that's how it's used. So okay, okay. okay. I do agree it's, it's a misinterpretation. I have a book that will prove to you that I agree. Okay? <laughs> so, you have, you have Christians who are doing this. Now, are Christians in the West oppressed? Yes, I believe that they are. Now, the conservative side is going to come out of me here, but it's your fault. All right? I look at our media, mass media. I look at our TV. Christianity is demonized in our TV stations. Morality, the standards that Christianity teaches, that I agree with, are attacked. Family is attacked in our media. And if you are a Christian and say, I disagree with you, then you're immediately labeled as ultra-conservative nutcase. I think a lot of Christians are ultra-conservative nutcases if they attack Islam, because they have no idea what it is. I understand your fear, but their fear comes out of ignorance. But when it comes to defending Christian values, I think they are right. But you, as a Christian, you are no longer, it's no longer a politically correct way to defend Christianity. So Christianity is absolutely oppressed. That's in the West. Christianity is absolutely oppressed, and there is a great danger that faces the Christians, about 10 million Christians in Egypt. They are being used as a weapon, political weapon, by the Salafis of Egypt. They will attack. By the, by the, who? By the who? By the Salafis, the Wahhabis, the sect. They will attack. They will attack their churches. They will do everything to pro provoke, to provoke a civil war, to turn the tide of uh, liberation that is taking place in Egypt. I have warned against this time and time again. And I do believe that if Christians have a cause that they should rally behind, it's helping the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Praise the Salafis. And you're taking this, you're hearing this from a Muslim who knows the region. Christians in, in Iraq were attacked by the Wahhabis. The churches were bombed. They lived there from the time of Christ. Nobody has bothered them. Now they bother them. But also are other Muslims, Sunnis and Shia, they're being attacked by them. Uh, I am proud to say that Ayatollah uh, Sistani in Iraq made a very powerful statement defending Christians in Iraq. He called them our brothers, we need to stand up for them, what is going to, what's happening against them is a crime against humanity, against the powers of Christ. 
But you come to Jordan, Christians have more freedom than anywhere else. You go to Syria, Christians have more freedom than anywhere else. Syrians are fighting to keep the government in place because the government gave more freedom than any other region in the Middle East. If you go to Turkey, uh, Myrna, excuse me, um, Armenian Christians are oppressed. Other Christians are not oppressed. If you go to Pakistan, I'd hate to be a Christian in Pakistan. If you go to Iran, they actually have more freedom, in my opinion, than here. I would, I met with Christians in Iran and Tehran, where they were given up, given out leaflets, and given out sharing the good news, basically, in the streets of Tehran. And Iran. So it is not a universal statement to cover Christians. I would say that Muslims are oppressed too, oppressed by their own people. Last year, according to the United Nations statistics, 98% of victims of Islamic terrorism were Muslims. We have never had in the history of Islam anybody attacking people in a mosque or a church or a church or a synagogue. I remember clearly, and I grew up in a Muslim, I mean, in a Muslim Sunni country, being taught when people are in their place of worship, it's a sin to distract a little one attack. Yet we're, we are facing the biggest challenge of our lives. Now, I happen to believe that there is good in everything that happens. And I think what will emerge is a stronger Muslim community that will face its own internal ills, as I hope that Christians will wake up too, to what is being done to them. Because I really believe wholeheartedly that Christianity is being wiped out of the face of the US, not by Muslims. Muslims are not doing it. This may be the last question. I am here. I can answer all the questions. <laughs> Anybody? Go ahead. I think earlier I said that earlier I understood you to say that if the government or the the legal system in your country doesn't contradict your moral beliefs, you should follow it. If I won't say a woman who wants to drive is living in a situation where they can't, do they have the option of just leaving that or do they have to stay there and Yeah, buy this is a very good question. Actually a question that a lot of people ask me is what if what if the community decides that women should not cover their hair? What is our obligation? Move? It's easy to make these things. You know? Just get up and go. If there is a law in Minnesota that says I have to drink a glass of wine every day and I can't overturn it, I'll go to jail if I don't do that. If it's one month, I probably go to jail and suck it up. But if it's it's a harsher punishment, I'll move. And you know where I find this? This is exactly what the Quran says. If you cannot freely practice your faith, God's land is best. Move. Is it worse in the Quran? Move. Don't try to force your views on other people. Yes, I'll tell you, halal food, halal meat. I believe that everybody should practice that part of Sharia. Because the way we slaughter animals is that it has to be organic. Sounds great, doesn't it? It has to be organic, free of chemicals. It has to be killed in a very merciful way. You cannot show it the animal, it has to be hung, blood dried out of it, uh, drained out of it, and all that stuff. I would love for everybody to practice Sharia halal food, because it's very healthy for try to persuade people to eat halal food all the time. I'm not going to force anybody. If they like the blood sausages, all the power to them. Doctors like that because they get a lot of money from treating them, right? <laughs> so there are aspects of Sharia law that I would love for people to know. I really do. You know, one aspect of Sharia law that I truly, truly find to be amazingly practical is that when you give your charities a cup, you're supposed to look first to your neighbors. Does anybody need it? Plymouth, I can't find anybody who needs it, right? Then you go to a larger community larger community, larger community, and this is exactly how you do it. You just keep looking to your neighbors. When I, when I always say, I always have the right to skip Wisconsin. Right? <laughs> but it's a practical, I would love for everybody to do the same. You know? I would love for everybody to say, hey, let me take care of my neighbor, let me take care of my community. In Turkey, I learned this um, recently from a professor who's a Turkish professor. He said in Turkey, if you go to, uh, I think it was a shoe place, you go to a shoe place, you buy shoes, and they're busy for you. They say, go to my neighbor. Please don't skip my neighbor. So it's a shoe salesman. So they send you to the competition. That's a great aspect of Sharia law, where you're supposed to care for your neighbor. And by the way, your neighbor is not your physical neighbor. Your neighbor is anybody who's your neighbor in humanity, too. Can I ask you, you 
mentioned you have children. Yes. Do you have girls and boys? Both boys and girls, yes. What do you tell your daughters about their equal rights to your sons? I don't tell them anything. I educate them. I share with them. Do they what listen? I <laughs> Some. <laughs> no, remember they are American kids. <laughs> they find their own. own. <laughs> Could you speak to the issue of male female equality? Yes. My upbringing and my understanding of Islam uh, is that there isn't any place for inequality. Any place for inequality. Yes, there are Muslims who believe that women should not drive, should not be judges, should not be uh, leaders, should not leave the house sometimes. But the form of Islam that I know, that I studied by the way, I, didn't, I don't have the same faith as my parents. I studied and I converted and I did a lot of crazy things in my lifetime, right? The form of Islam that I know, Muslims are presidents, they're allowed to be presidents, judges, commanders, they're martial artists, they're cab, dri I mean, the cab drivers, actually, bus drivers, believe it or not, but they're uh, race car drivers, astronauts, whatever they want to do. Absolutely, 100% equal. Now, let me give you an example. So this form of Islam says that a man has the right to, for, to marry four wives. A woman has nothing to do with it. She cannot say anything about it. And this form of Islam that I practice says the man has the right to if his wife agrees with him. If your first wife says, you're married, I'm a man. If I go to my, by the way, if I go to my wife and say, I, I want to take a second wife, she'll kill me. <laughs> I know she'll be killed. But let's say that I said, hey, honey, you know, I want to take another wife. I need to ask her permission. Can I do that? And she says, no, I have no right. It's a sin for me. So there are deep interpretations, deep divisions within Islam about inter understanding of our own faith. I say that they exist in every faith out there. What the danger is, is if one of them is more powerful than others, and it prevails. The problem is, literally, we have 65 million Muslims who control oil, the oil. They have 4,000 missions in the Muslim world alone, teaching other Muslims, young Muslims, this form of Islam. That's a big danger. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Let's have lunch. Just a couple of final remarks. Uh, we're going to be serving lunch. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we would like to sit with you and have lunch together. Um, just right uh, behind the wall there. And uh, when you are ready to leave after the lunch, please uh, serve yourself to all the uh, leaflets, uh, more leaflets, more CDs, DVDs, all free. So um, uh, don't uh, take, it, take more if you want and share it with others. And thank you again for coming. <laughs>